So today we're doing another Jack the Ripper case. This time it is Martha White or other known as Martha Tabaram. Now the speculation whether it was Jack that actually did it or maybe just been another serial killer or another killer because it was murders going on in the East End. So they used to call it the Whitechapel murders but they still encompassed it into Jack the Ripper. So I'll see you after this intro. <laughs> So welcome back and welcome back to Murder He Wrote in where I look at solved cases and also unsolved cases of real crimes that have taken place in the UK and around the world. So today, as I mentioned before, I'm going to be speaking about the young lady called Martha White or Martha Tabram, which was a married name. So Martha was born on the 10th of May 1849. Her parents were called Charles and her mother was called Elizabeth. They both grew up in Southwark, where obviously that's where she was born, and she lived there for the remainder of her life. She was married to someone called Henry Tabaram, which again, that's when she changed her name, and they had two children, and they both lived in the East So let's End. talk about Martha, and let's just get to know a bit on what she was like. So she was married to a, a gentleman called Henry Tabaram, and they had two children. Martha was born in the 10th of May in 1849, as I mentioned earlier. But little did they know, people don't know this about her, she had actually five siblings and she was actually the youngest. Let's speak about her father first. Her father was called Charles Samuel White. He was a warehouse a man and his wife, which is called Elizabeth, was a housewife. So let me tell you about her siblings and let me tell you in the age order. Henry, Stephen, Esther and Mary Ann and obviously she was the youngest which was Martha. Then in May 1865 tragedy struck and her parents split and they separated. So Martha went to live with her father and but unfortunately six months later her dad passed away. So this is when she ended up meeting Henry and they later married and Henry was a foreman at a furniture factory so she, two years later, and they grew really, really close and they ended up marrying. 1869, actually on Christmas Day, which was the 25th of December. It is said it was one of the happiest times of Martha's life. And then this is when she went on to have two of her children with actual Henry. Then in 1871, things were looking great for Martha and Henry. So they decided to move closer to her family home. And then this is when, obviously, I mentioned they had the two February children. February 1871, she had Frederick John Talbert, that was her first son. And then in 1872, she again conceived and had another child called Charles Henry Talbert. Then, unfortunately, things just got from bad to worse. And obviously, after her father dying and her being the youngest and him obviously passing suddenly, um, it was known that Martha began to start drinking and she wasn't just drinking a little bit she just started to drink quite heavily which put a severe um, strain on her relationship with her husband and in 1875 they ended up splitting. So she moved away and uh, she left her two children with her husband which when she did move her husband kept um, paying her and giving her 12 shillings a week for her living expenses until obviously until she could find something else or find somebody else or she end up starting working however she her husband found out that she was working and she was working as a prostitute so he was like i don't think so you've got an income so i'm not paying you any more money and he loaded it down to and because she was living with another guy she was with another man he loaded it to two shillings a week and sixpence Again, though she was with another man, she was also working as a prostitute. So he wasn't looking after her, even though they separated. But I don't think they got divorced. I couldn't find whether they divorced or this not. This is where Martha decided, to obviously, to stay with Henry Turner, who was actually a carpenter. So he was making a decent wage. But they were, it was an off and on relationship. It wasn't like her love of her life. I think she kind of like just had somebody that she just thought, you know, oh, what the hell? I think, let me just see how it goes and what happens. But they stayed together and she was, as I mentioned, they were together off and on for a fair amount of time until roughly about three weeks before she was murdered is when they kind of split. And it was reported that 
the biggest problem that she had in a relationship with Henry, who seemed to be really quite tolerant of her, even while she was prostituting, was for the fact is that she drank too much and she was severely, severely an alcoholic. And in them days, obviously, as we know, the, the support for alcoholism is probably next to none. But in them days, you could drink, but anyone who was drinking as excessive as she was, obviously could land himself in a severe, severe, a lot of trouble, which we are going to find out later on as I start speaking about the things leading up to her death or the situations that happened up leading to her past. Even though they were together, um, unfortunately, Henry lost his job and on, in 1888, they had to find some form of earning money. So they were sell selling articles in the street for small bits and pieces. So from what I see here, it says, a selling trinkets and small items so i assume he was selling stuff down the street in order to make to make an income and because henry wasn't obviously earning even though he was a skilled worker as a carpenter nothing was really flourishing so, frankly martha's getting a bit pissed and she was a bit, a bit fed, fed up with not really earning en enough money and she was getting really frustrated and she it was just like this her the earnings that she was getting and she was living at four place just off commercial road and it was a lodgings but the money she had to make in order to live there was wasn't enough so she had to find alternate ways of living and remember them days they never had um, benefits they never had um the kind of setup that we have now like you know housing benefit anything like that there was none of that was around so whatever you earn is what you gave to live to survive and remember, there's also you had to have food and things of that nature as well. So it was pretty yeah. tough. It's pretty tough. You know, report said by the time of her death, if things got that bad for her, that she had no other way of earning money but to sell her body for sex. That was the only way she could survive. And it's the only way she can get through because remember, she was probably in her 40s now and she didn't have much money and to make to make an earning most women fell into prostitution in the East End. And this is typical of how it would have happened for so many people, for those unfortunate ladies who don't find a proper suitor. And if they did, you know, even with Henry, Henry Turner, who she was with, he lost his job. So he was obviously in and out of working and selling whatever he can sell in order to have a lodgings, food and so on. But what I found interesting though she didn't have much money she could drink i'm not sure how all that came about i don't know how it was set up financially to do with alcohol back then but i'm just thinking about now if you have money and you spend it on drink you know i think you know the, the balance out seems a bit weird so i'm not really sure how she could afford money to be to get really drunk but you're not food enough to have food or lodging so let's talk about the murder on the 6th of august in 1888, this was the date when the murder took place. Martha was drinking ale with a, another same sex worker um, as her um, called Mary Ann Connolly. Now, Mary Ann Connolly was known as the Pearly Pearl, and they were drinking ale with two men or two soldiers at the Angel and Crown close to the George yard building so that wasn't far from where she lived so four of them paired off and decided to leave the public house and then they separated roughly about 11 45 and they both had their um soldier each as they went about the same when martha ended up leaving her client but she did and she went down um george yard which is a north south facing alleyway which leads onto wentworth street which leads on to Whitechapel. So she left Whitechapel High Street and went through a covered um, like archway which led to the White Hart Inn, which is in the East End or in Whitechapel. So there was Georgian Buildings, which is, was built in 1876. And it was Polly, which is Mary Ann Connolly, took her partner or the person she was with and arrived uh, she was walking through there she came out the other end which was called angie angel alleyway this is where she took her the person she met or the soldier she met in the pub let's just speak of, so what happened with martha it is said that a a resident of the resident buildings where martha was found heard 
in the early hours heard screaming or like of murder, murder. And but think about it in the 18th century, 1888 in the East End, you know, the neighbours would have heard it. It's just like you hearing a police car go by or you hearing some sort of kids shouting and screaming. It's just one of them things. So she just didn't pay much attention to it. She just carried on her bit. So about 2 a.m., two residents returned back to the Georgian building and they were husband and wife, Joseph and Elizabeth Mahoney. But they said that they saw nobody in the actual building. So, you know, they just thought, they just went about their business as well. So as I mentioned, at two o'clock, that these two residents returned and we had also another policeman who was actually on the beat patrolling the area. He went by at two o'clock and he noticed that there was somebody loitering about. So he went over and questioned him like, why are you here? And it was actually a grenadier. Now a grenadier, a poor picture of a grenadier up here. Now grenadier actually lived and worked at the Tower of London. They were like a soldier. Now they obviously they got the two soldiers who, you know, Martha and um, Mary picked up when they both left the public house. But when he, the policeman questioned this grenadier asking like why are you here what are you up to he simply said that oh he's just waiting for no, his he's friend. half past three now a driver a resident who obviously lived in the building he was a driver he was a cabbie actually um his name was albert george crow he returned and he noticed on the first floor of the georgian flats that um, this is where he saw um martha's body the stupid thing about this is that because it wasn't well lit he took it for that person for a vagrant like would just be tossing there and sleeping there so it wasn't until the following morning at 5 a.m that somebody noticed and saw her body laying on this stairwell and noticed that no, she was actually the person i noticed that the, that obviously martha was dead because he was coming down the stairs and he was a dock worker or a labor dock worker his name was john sanders reeves he came down the stairs and noticed and saw Martha dead, being killed, laying on the stairs. So it was actually Reeves that sent for the actual policeman and brought him back to say he found this dead body. And it was down to the policeman, obviously the um, PC Barrett, who turned around and fetched for the doctor. His name was Dr. Um, Timothy Robert Clean. He examined the body. He arrived there roughly about 5.30. He diagnosed that Martha was killed three hours before. So if we count about three hours, we're looking roughly at two o'clock. So that scream that a woman heard was Martha being murdered. And the, and obviously Mrs. Hewitt didn't investigate or she would have found Martha being attacked. Now the killer, you know, who said he's Jack the Ripper, um, stabbed um, uh, Martha over 39 times in the neck, in the body, and a lower abdomen and also in the genital area. Now, this is why they feel it was Jack the Ripper. Now, this is before Jack the Ripper started removing organs. He was just attacking and stabbing people. This is why I think people or the police said that this is the work of Jack the Ripper because the, 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 the wounds where these, these stab marks took place, it was in the lower intestine, the genital area, almost like they hated what these people did do. So that's why they were using this kind of method of killing. I'll tell you how, I'm just gonna read this because I wanna make sure I get the scene right. Um, she was laying on her back and her clothing was raised um, to the middle, exposing the lower half of her body. This indicated her body was laying in a sexual position. Dr. Clean, however, um, could not give evidence if there was intercourse or not so they couldn't determine whether she actually had sex or she was raped the testimony of the doctor was said it was between the killing took place between two o'clock and half past three so maybe the scream happened at two o'clock which obviously mrs hewitt heard then the people came back you know at half past three and maybe he was disturbed so he silenced her and then that's when he left the body there after half past three and that's is when remember i said about two o'clock they saw um this gentleman this grenadier waiting around for his friend so this is it more points 
towards that direction. It could have been this other grenade. So let's talk about the investigation. Now, the interesting thing was the Metropolitan Police were called. Now, the guy that who took over the inspector that dealt with this was a guy called Edmund Reed from H Division. Now, you may recall him. He was at the last video of Jack the Ripper, which I mentioned when I said about the murders that took place. He was the one also, I must add, that dealt with the Emma Smith case, um, who was bludgeoned, um, obviously within the genital areas with a blunt instrument and then died in Whitechapel Hospital. See my vi a video for that, I'll put the link above so you can see that video because it, it does link to this because obviously it's a series of videos. Now, the wise man himself, PC, PC Barrett, he was, who remember the one who actually was on patrol and he spoke to this grenadier. So what they did, the, obviously um, Edmund Reed decided to send the PC to Tower of London to identify this guy, identify the person, because he spoke to him. So he should be able to identify him, right? So anyway, he went along to Tower of London and then he spoke to the superior officer. So they got everybody who was on leave that night to stand in a parade. So he stood in the parade and he chose somebody. He said, this is a guy. And so he was like, this, he said, this is the man I spoke to. So the superior officer said to him, are you sure this is the guy? So he said, no, it's this guy. And he goes, and then he said, they said, are you sure? So he said, yeah, 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 yeah. No, it can't be this guy because that guy I spoke to had medals. But in the meantime, this other guy is already gone. So he identified the wrong individual. So after choosing, obviously, Larry, they looked, they investigated, and what he said, I just want to just read this. And he said that he went to see an old friend of his up in Brixton. Um, but what the statement said was, according to Larry, he was upset that he missed his friend, who was called Private Law. And so he, after closing, decided to go for a walk. And he, so he went to walk down to the Strand. As he walked down to the Strand, he arrived at about 4.30. And then he said he went to Billingsgate before returning back to the Tower of London. Now, they interviewed law, which is private law, which is private means a status in the army. And his last name's law. I don't know his first name. And interviewed him separate. And basically, they, they collaborated each other's story. But because... Um, the PC was unsure and choosing about which is who, they couldn't identify, you know, which one it was or who, who, if this was, who was the one that he spoke to. Now, it's more than likely that he did and um, what they were saying was a load of bull because, you know, they could have walked through Whitechapel um, because it is on its way to Billings Gate. So they could have turned around and done that, and they could have turned and been the one that he spoke to. But they were, if they're collaborating each other's story, and they were both in it, then you know, what's to say that they wasn't lying to the police? However, it's not over yet. There was another dude, another soldier. He was a Corporal Benjamin. His name. He was able. He he wasn't around. They could not account for where this guy was. So basically, he said that he went off to Kingston upon Thames to visit his um, father. And again, they looked at this and it was collaborated that it was true that he went to see his so father. So the interesting thing. Connolly, do you remember the one who was with Martha on the night who picked up these two men? She decided to go AWOL and wasn't communicating with the police. So she decided to chip and she went off to, um, she disappeared and went to um, Drury Lane and hid there with her cousin until the 9th of August. So basically she missed the parade at the Grenadiers, yeah, the Grenadiers parade in order to identify this individual person. So this took place at Tower of London. So it got rescheduled for the, it was rescheduled for the 13th of August when then um, Connolly returned back to London or back to the area and she took place and she said that okay I'll do the identification and I'll see if I can find the person that did it however when she did look she said no there was none of them because they wasn't even dressed the same they were dressed with white bands which was somebody with a totally different regiment from what the actual PC basically said. the white bands that were worn are by the Coldstream Guards uh, rather than the Grenadier Guards, which didn't wear that, and because the Grenadier Guards were based at the Tower of London. So 
obviously now Cunley was now taken on the 15th to identify these two people that she and Martha picked up on that night. So when she chose these two people, unfortunately, both of them had alibis. It's a bit confusing because I'm sure she would have known who they were, but I feel she was trying to dodge the bullet because maybe she knew more than she let on than this whole CEO fiascos of situations. Maybe she knew more than what happens and maybe she was more worried about her own life than opposed to trying to find out who killed a so-called friend. There's a little alibis. One of them was actually at home with his wife and his wife verified this and so did his family and friends. And the other one was actually in the barracks. So there's no way this other person could have been, either one of them could have been out in Whitechapel. So on the 14th of August, um, her poor husband, her poor strained husband, who probably ain't seen her for a while, was called to identify her body. And this is what they said that she was wearing, and obviously after the death when she was murdered, she was wearing a black bonnet with a long black jacket, green with a green shirt, brown petticoat and stockings, and a spring double-sided boots. With so Mar Martha was five foot three, and at the inquest on the 23rd of August, they determined obviously her she was murdered she was dead and they said that they put it down as a verdict of murdered by a person's or persons unknown and unfortunately did no one was ever arrested and tried and convicted of a murder so now there you go that is the actual um story of martha white or martha tabaran who was one of the victims supposedly one of the victims of jack the ripper or one of the white chapel murder murders so if this is of interest to you please do subscribe to the channel or also leave a thumbs up it helps the channel i'm going to be doing a series of videos of jack the ripper and obviously the suspects i'll be doing soon but i'm looking at all the victims first and telling you a bit more depth information about the victims so thanks for your time and thanks for listening and watching and i'll see you on the next video take care